Hi there, Smart Drivers talking to you tonight about speed, speeding, and speeders, and try and answer the question about why people speed and why they don't care, because many people do speed driving above the posted speed limit, and it's not that they don't care, it's that they don't think it's dangerous, and we want to talk about why it's dangerous, because most traffic safety authorities, turf here in Canada, the traffic authority in Australia, other countries in the world will say that speed is one of the leading causes of crashes. And I disagree with that statement. I do not believe that speed causes crashes. I believe that the mismanagement of speed and space causes crashes and more so space than speed. Because if speed indeed did cause crashes, we would have twice the number of crashes in on highways and freeways than we do in the city, but in fact, it's actually the inverse of that. We actually have more crashes in cities when speeds are half what they are out on the highways, but out on the highways, as the point that is made, we have more fatal crashes, crashes that take lives and kill people uh, out on highways and freeways and those types of things. But I'm gonna argue that speed is not the cause of crashes. The mismanagement of space and speed are the causes of crashes. Lots of people tuning in here tonight. Uh, Sean here from Brooklyn Park. My friend Marion here. Uh, yes, it is cold. From <laughs> it's cold all over British Columbia. It's hard to think that it's almost spring here. Uh, Fred asked me some questions about technology, and I'll get back to that. Uh, Evan is talking about uh, knowing your speed without having to look at your speedometer and yes as you get more and more experience you will be able to know within a certain reason you know a certain measure or tolerance uh, what your speed is and what you're traveling at uh, Mallory's tuning in my friend from the Maritimes uh, Corey is here bricks for wheels he is the moderator does an excellent job of keeping out the bad people and getting up the videos that I suggest you have a look at for uh, further information on the questions that you ask me and I give you answers to uh, KJ uh, tuning in from Ajax, uh, CN, hello, and uh, that's everybody. Uh, Alex is here as well, so hi there, everybody. And uh, so the way that it works here, we uh, spend about 10 or 15 minutes, 10 or 12 minutes, rather, on the presentation, and then after that, we come back, we spend the remainder of the hour answering all your questions and talking and discussing the topic at hand, which tonight is speeding, speeders, and... Uh, I actually had a discussion here on the channel with one of the smart drivers about the United States and the legal use of uh, radar detectors there, um, which was uh, something that had not come up on the channel before. Uh, I thought that they were illegal, and I stood corrected on that point. They are illegal for commercial drivers, and that may have been where my confusion was uh, in the United States. But for personal vehicles, you can buy a radar detector. Now, those of you who may not know what radar radar detectors are they are devices that you can buy you can mount them in your car the way that you would a dash cam and they will tell you where speed traps are set up now I've read a bunch of stuff I of course I googled it and I was looking on reddit and some of the posts and those types of things uh, you can buy inexpensive radar detectors that are probably two or three hundred dollars they don't work very well you gotta buy the expensive ones that are a thousand twelve hundred dollars if you're gonna invest that kind of money into a radar detector, you are probably an incessant speeder. That's what the conclusion was that uh, you know these forums came to was that you're a professional speeder. If you're gonna invest that kind of money in a radar detector, you're a professional speeder. And uh, Quora, which is you know answers questions, it's a website that does that. Uh, there were some police officers, retired police officers and whatnot who were being interviewed on that channel are on that platform and uh, they were saying that uh, you know oftentimes they're kind of on the fence about whether they're going to give a speeding ticket to somebody or not and uh, if they're on the fence and they pull somebody over and they see in the vehicle that they have a radar detector that is the deciding factor that in fact the person is going to get a ticket <laughs> because they see the sign of a radar detector as being a you know they're professional speeders they invested in a radar detector. They want to avoid tickets. So let's, uh, uh, Marizone, hello, uh, elevator fan. My cough is degreased. You're feeling better. 
Uh, Fred says he's here over the road truck driver from the United States and he was asking me questions about uh, technology and Fred remind me of that and I'll come back to that after the presentation and we'll talk about technology and vehicles because of course this is another uh, piece of driving that's now coming into effect is that technology is encroaching more and more into our control of the vehicle and it's taking over in emergency situations and there isn't anything that we can do about it now like i said i love technology love it in vehicles i think that uh, adaptive cruise control and lane assist are really great features in newer vehicles however as you pointed out uh, sometimes you know we get reliant on them and then but there's an emergency situation and the technology simply fails us do we have an option to turn it off are we safer if we are driving the vehicle completely without these kind of backup systems in place because they aren't they've been shown to fail I mean Tesla is all about the marketing of their self-driving vehicles and <laughs> you know they've had crashes and unfortunately there's been fat fatalities and those types of things so uh, it's not uh, it's not perfect for sure uh, Mallory, just wondering why live stream is a little earlier this evening. Uh, Mallory, we had a scheduling conflict with my son's sports. So that's why it's a little bit earlier tonight because I had to get everybody to sports. Uh, you know, uh, when you're a single parent and you're trying to juggle these things, sometimes things have to move around a little bit. So I appreciate everybody showing up a little bit early. Uh, Caramel, yes, okay, please do more videos. I will do that. Uh, love your videos, helps for taking driving tests. Awesome. Uh, all right, so let's get over to the presentation here and we'll get through that and then we'll come back and uh, answer your questions for the remainder of the hour. So speed, speeders, and speeding. We're talking about speed as being the cause of... There we go. Okay, so we're back. For those of you new to Smart Drive Test, uh, my name is Rick August, was a truck driver in the 1990s, became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1997, uh, earned my doctorate from the University of Melbourne uh, in legal history, which is the study of policing, courts, and prisons. My expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic. While I was going to university in Australia, I drove buses for Greyhound, one of the regional bus lines. Uh, Australians like to claim that they founded Greyhound while, they were, while I was there, but uh, we did some fact checking there. Uh, a couple weeks ago and found out that in fact it was founded in the United States so it's not an Australian uh, company uh, started the online uh, company uh, started the online smart drive test uh, YouTube channel and business in 2015 and it has been wildly more successful than I could have imagined and this year we're gonna hit 300,000 on the YouTube channel which is just awesome so thank you everybody for that all the smart drivers that have passed the driver's test and become safer, smarter drivers because of the information we presented here on the channel. And check out the autobiography over at the Smart Drive Test website, and Corey has put the link down in the description there. Thank you for that, Corey. All right, uh, good stuff to have a look at the podcast over in the Smart Drive Test website. Uh, links down in the description. Uh, new driver defensive driving for drivers who just got their license because you are at the highest risk of being involved in a crash due to inexperience. As well, if you're coming up for a driver's test, have a look at the video, Unexpected Events on a Driver's Test. Yellow traffic lights, turning right on a red light, emergency vehicles. These are examples of unexpected events that you may have on a driver's test. For some people living in rural areas, for example, you may never encounter an emergency vehicle during the course of your training when you're learning how to drive and preparing for a driver's test. For people in New York City and Los Angeles and Chicago, on the other hand, you're gonna encounter emergency vehicles every day that you're out driving around. And uh, recently, just back in January, was doing some driver training. Uh, one of the drivers uh, on the course said, oh yeah, I can pass the driver's test. And of course, <laughs> we went out half an hour later and emergency vehicle went by, they didn't pull over right away. And I said, well, you just failed your driver's test. So without preparation, your chances of passing a driver's test, uh, without preparation, without training, without the right instruction, your chances of passing a driving test are less than 50%. So get driver training to be successful and passing your driver's test first time. All right, uh, we'll have a look at those videos. I'll pull them up after the presentation. All right, so as the speed in the vehicle increases, the 
energy in the vehicle doesn't increase, but it increases exponentially. So if we take 20 kilometers an hour, for example, which is about 12 miles an hour, you have a factor of X, you have this much energy in the vehicle. If you double the speed to 40 kilometers an hour, now you're you know, doing 24 miles an hour, it's two times X. So now you have four times the amount of energy in the vehicle. Maybe some of you have seen those crash videos uh, on Twitter and other social media platforms where they crash the car or the bus into the uh, fixed object. And this is what it looks like at, you know, 20 miles an hour, this is what it looks like at 40 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour, 200 miles an hour, they get kind of crazy with it all. But by the time you get up to 100 kilometers an hour, which is 60 miles an hour, so uh, 12 miles an hour up to 60 miles an hour, now at 100, or 100 kilometers an hour, which is 60 miles an hour, you have 20 times the amount of energy in the vehicle as you did at 12 miles an hour. So you can see that the energy in the vehicle increases exponentially so speed is a factor in how much damage is going to happen when the crash occurs so you can see why there are more fatal crashes on highways freeways and interstates than there are in the city most of the crashes in cities end up being uh, simply property damage speeding what are the definitions of speeding uh, it's not as simple as exceeding the posted speed limit faster than the posted speed limit, fast driving faster than the traffic flow, because we know for the most part that police have discretion in terms of giving traffic tickets. And if you are simply keeping up with the traffic flow and the traffic flow is kind of five to 10 miles an hour more than the posted speed limit, it's unlikely that you're going to get pulled over by police. Most of the time, police are looking for excessive speeders. They're looking for anybody who's doing 15 miles an hour more than what the posted speed limit is. Speeding faster than me and faster than the conditions of the roadway will allow, okay? In 2016, the NHTSA, uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Association in the United States, stated that for the most, uh, in 2016 and for the most of the past two decades, around a third of all fatalities were caused by speeding drivers, around one third, so 33%. Again, I don't agree with that statement because if that statement was true, we would just have to all stop driving. We wouldn't be in cars at all. But they believe, and many of these traffic safety authorities push forward with the idea and the main cause of crashes is speed. All right, uh, speeding, and it's been an issue for police since the invention of the motor car, uh, trains, uh, motorcycles, uh, not motorcycles, motorcycles, bicycles, cars, whatnot. So in the beginning of motorized traffic, uh, motorized traffic changed policing forever because once we move from horse-drawn traffic to motor traffic, speeds in cities increased 500% because many people are duped by Hollywood thinking that a horse can travel, run, you know, pulling a wagon all day long at 20 or 30 miles an hour. That's completely untrue. Horses can only walk at about six miles an hour, six and a half miles an hour, which is about the same as what a person walks. So don't be duped by what's going on in Hollywood movies. If you see the horses, the team of horses pulling the stagecoach and they're you know, galloping down the roadway, they can only do that for about 20 minutes and then they're done for the rest of the day. So speeding forever increased, increased police powers. Uh, by the end of the 1920s, uh, courts were clogged with uh, speeding tickets and infractions and finally police had to be uh, imbued with greater police power so that they could control policing and they were able to give tickets on the spot. It's the same thing as what's happening with drink driving now that they're able to confiscate your car for 24 hours uh, if you blow the near the limit and those types of things were simply increasing police powers because the courts are proving ineffective to police speeding and to police drink driving. So it Speeding has forever changed the ur uh, urban and rural landscape, and now we have an entire culture of automotive safety and driving culture. But keep in mind that traffic laws no more prevent crashes than criminal law prevents violent crime. So we could say that everybody could drive around at the posted speed limit, and there are countries that have this. Australia has widespread use of speed cameras, but nobody's pointing at Australia and say, look at their... Uh, crash record. It's super low. That's simply not true. That is not true at all.
All right, a case study. So Australia rigidly enforced speed limits. Uh, most people do not drive more than 62 miles an hour, 100 kilometers an hour. Uh, you want to look at the Autobahn, where for the most part, they don't have speed limits. Uh, and nobody points at the Autobahn and say, look at how many crashes they have. Uh, here in Canada, where I live in the province of British Columbia on the Trans-Canada Highway, uh, in the last few years, it was the speed limit was increased from 62 miles an hour to 75 miles an hour, which was... 100 kilometers an hour to 120 kilometers an hour and that is still in place here that that increased speed limit uh, has stayed in effect and nobody's pointed at the Trans Canada Highway and said oh look at the tremendous in crash, uh, increase in the number of crashes you have more fatal crashes yes but you don't have more crashes per se because they've increased the speed limit on the Trans Canada Highway now, speed differentials, this is something that I do believe does cause crashes. The difference between the speed of your vehicle and say that of a pedestrian, for example. Because many people when they drive fail to recognize the difference between speeds of different road user groups. And if we could implement this into our driver training, we would make roads safer. So for example, most people are driving around cities at 25, 30 miles an hour. A pedestrian is traveling at five or six miles an hour and if you could imbue them with that information impart that information to them where you say this you know the speed differential is 20 miles an hour at minimum 25 miles an hour so you're going to gain on a pedestrian much much faster than you will say on a motorcycle then we would begin to reduce and implement safety structures around the way that people drive and when they're faced and encounter other road users on our roadways. So we separate traffic in two, two ways, the physical space, but we're limited with the amount of space that we have on our roadway. So the other way that we separate traffic is through time at intersections with traffic lights, one lane of traffic goes and then the cross street goes. Okay, so almost 25% of traffic fatalities are pedestrians and I read something on Twitter today, I don't know whether this was true, but there's a significant, a huge increase in the last, since 2010 in the number of pedestrian fatalities and they're blaming it or they're pointing the finger at larger SUVs and they're also blaming it on distracted driving. That more and more people are driving distracted and pedestrians are also distracted when they're walking because they're looking at their phones while they're walking up and down the roadways okay summertime you ask most people when they when the most number of crashes happen during the year most people will say oh my god it's january february in the middle of winter time when in fact it's actually the opposite we're coming into the highest number of traffic crashes during the year june july and august and part of september those are the highest crash months uh, for the northern hemisphere Police speeding, let's talk about speeders, for example. <laughs> we talk about the culture of speeding. Even Google is on board with helping to locate speed traps along the highway. I was Googling this last year. My brother was doing a road trip across the country and I was looking at his route and I noticed that on the phone, they actually tell you on Google where the speed traps are located. So speed cameras, culture of driving, and I was talking about speed cameras. Uh, there was another article in the paper that came across a couple of weeks ago about uh, Ottawa, the capital city of Canada, that they're putting in 200 more speed cameras and that they had a 300% increase in the compliance with speed limits. But they did not say that they had reduced the number of traffic crashes. And there are charges labeled, are leveled at speed cameras that they're simply a money grab and there has been evidence to support that because of where the speed cameras are located for the most part. And I'll find a book and I'll put it down in the description for you where I was reading. Uh, I had a whole chapter talk dedicated to speed cameras. People dislike speed cameras. And I'll tell you after the presentation about the speed camera ticket that I got uh, two years ago. Okay, so culture of driving. It's, it's almost a badge of honor to speed and not get caught, but you know, even Google is on board with getting away with speeding. And of course, when there's a speed trap and other traffic's coming by in the opposite lane, they will flash their lights out to tell you that there's a speed cam uh, speed trap set up down the road and those types of things. So social driving, social driving encourages speeding as well. You stand at intersections, you see the light go yellow, 
drivers are going to speed up to make it through the intersection and it is more socially acceptable to speed than it is to be late for an appointment. So for example, if you're going to a job interview, uh, you're gonna speed to get to the job interview on time. You're not gonna show up at the, dro the job interview uh, five minutes late and say, oh, you know, uh, I drove the speed limit. I didn't wanna be, you know, I didn't wanna put myself in danger or other people on the roadway. It's completely socially acceptable to speed to get to that appointment on time. Uh, truck drivers are paid piecemeal, which, you know, they're paid per mile that they, the number of miles that they make. So the more miles they make, the more money they make. Uh, this is mostly for over the road truck drivers. So despite the fact that, you know, most trucks now, company trucks are speed limited, it still encourages speeding amongst truck drivers and it encourages them to drive longer hours. And then of course, finally, you know, not really on the topic of speeding, but most people do not come to a complete stop at stop signed intersections. This is simply part of social driving. All right, so space management, as I talked to you previously in the introduction, I said that, you know, it's not speed that causes crashes, it's the mismanagement of space and the mismanagement of speed that causes crashes. You can always manage the space in front of your vehicle to keep yourself safe and you are going to be more proactive and predictable because you're not gonna be have to use the brakes as much and as so long as you're observing and checking out traffic in front of your vehicle, okay? When you're too close to other road users and too close to other fixed objects and you're driving at a high rate of speed, then you're going to get into trouble. This is when you're going to, uh, crashes are going to occur. Radar detectors, I had this discussion on the YouTube channel here, I was talking about this in the introduction that somebody said that they use a radar detector and uh, wanted to know why I didn't, wasn't able to talk, you know, decisively and correctly about radar detectors while well, I thought that they were illegal throughout with most cars in the, in the United States, but then I was corrected and found out that they were actually legal in personal vehicles in the United States. And the driver went on and actually left another comment this afternoon, you know, because uh, speed, speed traps are set up in arbitrary places, speed cameras, those types of things. So justified why he had a speed camera in his vehicle. So we can talk more about speed detectors, radar detectors, and those types of things uh, during the discussion here after the presentation. All right, so good luck on your driver's test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. All right, uh, Fred, I have experienced that sometimes in that they do not give accurate readings that there's a lot of traffic around you. Okay, uh, to let others know radar detectors in US and semi trucks are not legal, only some states will let you slide with them. Yes, and that's the thing, exactly what Fred just said, that in commercial trucks, uh, CDL vehicles, buses, and big trucks, semi trucks, uh, it's illegal to have a radar detector or what they're commonly called is a hound dog they're completely illegal in commercial vehicles, but you can use them in your personal vehicle uh, in the United States. So this is another piece of the driving culture that you know personal vehicles can have speed detectors in them, uh, radar detectors, but again, as I was saying, on the Reddit forums, you have to spend a fair bit of money to get one that is reliable, you know, $1,000, $1,200 to get a really good one. And if you get pulled over by police, and they ask you if you have, you know, if they can see it or you have a radar detector in your vehicle, uh, that's often gonna be the deciding factor that in fact you are going to get a speeding ticket. Uh, Cicada, uh, speeding in highways is something you need to be careful. I just passed my driver's test today, thanks to you, and we'll be driving quite uh, far from my new job, so good timing for this live stream, awesome. Congratulations on passing your driver's test. That is absolutely awesome, my friend. Thank you for stopping back and letting us know. And now you're gonna be driving, so that's really great. Uh, Fred, if you're owner operator with a semi-truck, you get paid usually percentage of the loads. Yes, there are different ways, uh, Fred, that you can get paid. You get paid by the hour, get paid a percentage of the load, as you said, with owner operators. Uh, I know that the owner operators that we hired when I was working in Ottawa, they were getting per mile, and, but I do know drivers that are getting per percentage of the load. Uh, the other way that they can get paid uh, per hour, per mile, uh, they can get 
paid a flat rate as well from to take it from point A to point B. So there's different ways that owner operators are going to be paid for sure. Uh, elevator. Whenever I go the speed limit though, a construction zone, everyone behind me tailgates me and I always feel pressured. And yes, that's the other piece of the social driving, the driving culture, that if you're driving slow through a construction zone or you're adhering to the speed limit, those types of things, other people are going to tailgate you to tell you to hurry up and they're gonna be driving closer to you. And this is what happens is, is that uh, when speeds slow down, the, the spaces between the vehicles get closer together. Now you have to go against social driving. You have to manage that space. You have to keep a good space between your vehicle and other vehicles on the roadway. And everything in social driving is tell you to do the opposite. You know, hurry up and go. Get as close to the other vehicle as you can. But to keep yourself safe and to be a safer, smarter driver, you've got to increase that speed. But it's one of the ways that we communicate in social driving is by tailgating other drivers to tell them that they're going slow. Kyle, uh, my first driver's test, I failed. The examiner had to intervene and I failed miserably. A month later, I tried again and passed thanks to your great videos and the Smart Driver course. And that is absolutely awesome, Kyle. Congratulations on passing your test the second time. Awesome, awesome. That is really great news. And thanks for dropping back and letting us know that you did in fact pass. Uh, Tim, my friend Tim is here from Drive Smart BC. No, new starting time just tonight, Tim. Had a scheduling conflict with kids and sports. So I uh, had to start a little bit early, but uh, still halfway there. Uh, if you're in the province of British Columbia, check out Tim's website, Drive Smart BC. Excellent, excellent information there about uh, traffic safety, traffic laws, uh, traffic engineering, road safety, maintenance, just about anything that you could think about in the province of British Columbia. Excellent, excellent resource there. So head over there and check that out. There's also a forum there that you can participate in and, and discuss issues and topics with other authorities and people in the industry as well. And uh, great, uh, great website over there at Drive Smart BC. So check that out. Uh, Fred, I would say be patient, uh, courteous, and let other drivers in that you want cut you off or trying to get over. Help prevents accidents. Yes, it does. And uh, the other piece with that, right? Uh, here's another part of the social driving is, is that we're all willing to let one car in, right? <laughs> we're all nice, but we're not let more than one car in nice, right? So if we're in bumper to bumper traffic and people are trying to get out on the roadway and merge, yeah, we're going to let our one vehicle in, but the car behind us has to let one vehicle in. And, uh, <laughs> so if we can do that, if we can all do that and let one, one car in, then it's going to be safer on the roadways. Now, you need to be patient, exactly what Fred was saying. You need to keep that space in front and you need to hang back. Space management needs to be your first priority when you're driving because if you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit something. So keep that space around your vehicles. And that is one of the difficulties for new CDL drivers, drivers that are upgrading to drive a bus or to drive a semi truck or just a five ton is getting used to how much space that larger vehicle takes and it's the same thing if you're going to start pulling a trailer a caravan trailer you know a camping trailer a utility trailer a boat trailer whatever kind of trailer that you're going to hook on behind your vehicle uh, you need more space to get that to maneuver that thing around and many people who move into a larger vehicle start having bings and bingles because they don't understand off tracking for one thing and they don't understand how to steer and maneuver a vehicle in tight spaces. Any monkey can get in a vehicle and point it straight down the road and drive it. <laughs> That's a fact. But maneuvering it in tight spaces, backing up, backing a trailer up, moving around, maneuvering a semi truck and those types of things, that's where the emphasis needs to be placed on our driver training. And unfortunately, the MELT programs that are coming into play, the mandatory entry level training, they are not focusing on turning and maneuvering as the priority for new CDL drivers. They're focusing on a whole bunch of other things, which is unfortunately not what they need to be focusing on to keep them safe. Uh, Tim said I missed the start of this one. I still spend a lot of time trying to get people to slow down and play nice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Keep their space. That's what we want them to do and be nice. Uh, Tim says I'm lucky to have experts in my user groups who help answer. Yes, and it's always great because, you know, 
when we build a community as Tim has done over at Drive Smart BC and as I have done here on Smart Drive Test with the YouTube channel and you know the radar detectors you know the comment there was really awesome because you know it, I learned stuff right to teach is to learn and you know I go on I start googling stuff I start doing research you know I start writing about it I start thinking about it and we all benefit from those comments that people leave because now we can all learn from each other and we can move forward and progress and come to you know a better sense of traffic safety and helping other people to stay safe and be smarter safer drivers on the roadway so thank you for all your comments and your feedback it really helps all of us uh to be safer smarter drivers uh david five miles an hour over on an open highway will be overlooked in most cases in the u.s as long as you don't go do other reckless things or have any outstanding violations is that also true in Canada yes David it is the same thing here there's discretion that 10 kilometers an hour over uh, you're probably not going to get pulled over for that uh, as one police officer who I tra train jujitsu with uh, was saying to me that a lot of times when they set up speed traps they're not looking for the people who are keeping up with traffic flow most of the time when they're uh, setting up a speed trap they're looking for excessive speeders they're looking for the people who are driving 20 30 40 miles an hour over the speed limit those are the people that they're trying to catch because those are the people that are dangerous it's not the people that are driving uh, five miles an hour or you know 10 kilometers an hour over the posted speed limit those are not the people that are dangerous uh, you know and it's the same thing if you know you're driving with the traffic flow and you're weaving in and out of traffic and you're jamming on your brakes and you're being really aggressive on the controls those are the people that are dangerous uh you know not the people who are driving in a straight line uh you know and whatnot so uh tim <laughs> thank you so much for that uh noah good evening how are you my friend uh, Fred, it depends on the officer when it comes to the speed, but yes, if you are being responsible and not doing crazy moves, you should be right. And yes, and the other piece about that getting pulled over by police, and probably next week I can do the one about being pulled over by police and what you should do and the procedures you should follow, uh, is, you know, I've been pulled over a lot of times. You can't drive professionally and not be pulled over, uh, especially, you know, before I became a driving instructor and those types of things. Uh, you know, eight times out of ten nine times out of ten they simply give you a warning they're not going to give you a, spe a ticket you know I did get some tickets for sure but for the most part if you talk nice to them treat them like a human being and don't deny what you did you're not going to get a ticket <laughs> so uh, be nice to police officers they're simply doing their job right and uh, you know unless you're doing something crazy and dangerous out on the roadway then yes for sure you're going to get a ticket uh, Tim, the nail with the head sticking up are the ones that get hammered. <laughs> there you go. Exactly what Tim just said. That's exactly true. If you're the one being crazy uh, out on the roadway, you're the one that's going to get the speeding ticket. You're the one that's going to get pulled over. So, you know, an example of this was a couple of years ago. I walked up to the corner and I, all of a sudden I hear this loud vehicle going past. You know, the muffler's broken, uh, weaving in and out of traffic. It's got an N sticker on the back, which is a novice driver. Uh, in their probationary phase of their GDL and they go screaming up to the light slam on the brakes at the red light and one of the brake lights is out and it's exactly what Tim just said the nail with the head sticking up is the one that's going to get hammered that's the kid that's going to get pulled over and get a speeding ticket KA please make a video about getting pulled over I would have no idea how to deal with that uh, except trying to be respectful uh, KA there are videos here on the channel about that specific topic here already and Corey will put those up for you and that'll definitely uh, give you some more information about getting pulled over. But essentially, you know, pull over in a safe place, answer the officer's questions, and you know, if you're respectful, as I said, it, you know, officers have discretion and maybe uh, you will or you won't get a ticket, but in my experience, um, you know, eight times out of 10, you're not gonna get a speeding ticket or, you know, get a ticket for whatever you did. You may get off with a warning, okay? Uh, Jake, my friend, how are you? Good evening, my friend. Yeah, we started a little bit early tonight because conflicts with sports and all kinds of other crazy things. So I appreciate you showing up a bit early. Uh, you just create more problems and likely you get a ticket. Yes, indeed. And as I said, we talked about uh, speed detectors, which are legal in personal vehicles in the United States. 
if you have a radar detector in your vehicle in the United States, you get pulled over for policing, there's a high probability that you, in fact, are going to get a, going to get a ticket. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of, here, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story about getting pulled over. Uh, and this is, this is the perfect example of don't deny what you did and follow the instructions of the police officer. I got pulled over in Pennsylvania. Uh, in a semi-truck, when you're driving a semi-truck and there's three lanes, you are not allowed in the left-hand lane. You, you need to be in the right two lanes. Somehow I got out, I got pushed out into the third lane and I couldn't get back over. I was actually, at this time I remember, I was actually trying to get over because I was guilty of being in the in the left lane more than I should have in a big truck. Anyway, I get pulled over by a Pennsylvania state trooper and <laughs> I'm in a cab over, so when you're in a cab over, it's considerably higher than a conventional truck. I mean, they're still high. And uh, the driver comes up and you know it's six feet to the bottom of the door and I'm in the truck and I'm waiting for the officer to come up because he's got to get out of the vehicle stopped on the side of the interstate walks up the side of the truck which is about you know two or three minutes seems like an eternity when you're waiting for the police officer to come up he comes up he yells up he's like license and registration for the truck <laughs> and I was like and I looked down and I sort of looking down on top of him and I said is there a problem officer <laughs> <laughs> he just like screamed. He was like, license and registration for the truck. He just like right at the top of his lungs. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and, you know, I thought I'm going to get a ticket for sure. That's what I'm thinking in my head because he just like screamed at me, right? So I got the license and the registration out and, you know, I handed it to him and he went back to the car and came back in about 10 minutes after checking everything out. And he did give me a warning and told me not to be in that lane. And I said, you know, I'll explain what happened. I got pushed out there and couldn't get back over because cars wouldn't let me. It was busy traffic and whatnot. And, you know, super nice. Uh, he actually even pulled out and stopped traffic in the lane so that I could get going because we were at the bottom of a bit of a hill and I was loaded. And, you know, it takes a bit of get going to get the old semi truck going there. But, you know, one experience of denying what happened and I was actually lucky in that situation because in most situations I probably would have got a ticket all right uh Fred do verbal warnings in Canada go on your driving record uh here it depends on what it was for but usually not uh Fred no they usually don't go on your record here as well and uh, what Fred is talking about as professional drivers CDL drivers we all have a driving abstract so if we get a ticket a speeding ticket for example we have points that will go on our driving abstract. And if we get hired by another company and they do, and you know, let me back up. The company that we're working for will do a safety audit once a year and they will pull your driving abstract to make sure that you don't have speeding tickets and those types of things because it affects their insurance. If they have truck drivers who are working for them and they have a lot of tickets and they have a lot of points, they can't drive their vehicles because they won't get insured under their insurance policy. So as part of the safety audit every year, your trucking company will pull your driving abstract. And if you go to work and want to work for a new company, then you're gonna have to provide that driver's abstract. Now, here in the province of British Columbia, where I live in Canada, uh, they're free. The ICBC, you just go online, you fill in your information, and they will send you your driver's abstract. Now, in other places in the province of Ontario, you had to pay for them, and I don't know what it's like in the States in terms of uh, getting your driver's abstract and how complicated that is. It will depend on which state you're in in the U.S. Uh, Tim says, warnings can go on a record if the uh, national safety code number is recorded on it. Okay, so there you go. And it's all of this driver's abstract and tickets and whatnot. Uh, national safety code is a huge thing to do with professional drivers. So you get into a whole different category uh, when you get a commercial license and you start working for a professional uh, a truck driving company. Uh, the carrier's record, not the driver's record. Okay, there you go. Uh, Fred, does Canada put a ticket on your car license as one if you were in a semi-truck here in the U.S.? It does not matter what vehicle you are now. Uh, no, Fred, it's pretty much the same 
both in Canada and the United States, the very minor differences. So if you get a speeding ticket in your personal vehicle, it just goes on your driving record and it goes on both, you know, both your CDL and your personal uh, insurance can see that. So it's not going to matter. It's the same as what it is there in the States for sure. All right. So speed, speeding and speeders. Uh, we we're talking about speed cameras. Uh, the uh, city of Ottawa, the federal capital here in uh, Canada, uh, putting in speed cameras and moving towards that. Uh, you know, speed cameras are a very political issue and they had speed cameras here in the province of British Columbia and some years ago, uh, one of the political candidates for the premier, uh, which is comparable to the governor in the U.S., uh, ran on the platform that if they got elected, they were going to eliminate speed cameras. And they did get elected on that platform that they were going to get rid of speed cameras. So we no longer have speed cameras in this province because of that. Now, Australia, as I said, has widespread use of speed cameras and nobody speeds on the main roads in the country of Australia because uh, if you're going faster than 100 kilometers an hour, you will get a speed camera ticket. And uh, I, as I said a couple of years ago, I got one when we were driving back to Ontario and I got one going through Saskatchewan. Uh, yes, we have a problem it's called Saskatchewan here. And I was a little annoyed with the ticket because if, you know, it's it very much is framed as a cash grab because it says on the ticket that if you pay the ticket, uh, there's no points on your license, there's no record of the ticket and all of the other information. So it's just pay the cash for the speeding ticket and you move on with your life. So in that sense, you know, because I, I know because of the legalities and proving that it was actually you, they don't know who the driver is in the car when they hand out speed camera tickets and whatnot. So, you know, it annoyed me that, you know, I just paid them $190 and nothing happens. There's no, there's no more repercussions from my speeding ticket. It's just, it, and it very much feels like when you get one of those speed camera tickets in the mail, it very much feels like it's a cash grab that they're just out there putting the speed cameras up so that they can fill the government coffers. And, you know, it kind of upsets me a little bit. Uh, Tim says, we do not, we do have speed cameras today. They are combined with red light cameras and are called intersection safety cameras these days. <laughs> I like the spin on that. Uh, intersection safety cameras these days. Now, uh, Tim, on that note of red light cameras, uh, I have a Garmin dash cam in my vehicle and it will warn me of red light cameras at intersections. Now, the other piece about that, the charge that has been leveled at red light cameras is that drivers coming up to red light cameras know that there is a red light at the camera, at the intersection. Yes, they're going to come to a stop, but, and I don't know whether there's any statistics that have been kept on this about drivers that get rear-ended at these intersections because they come up, they know there's a red light camera at the intersection and they hammer on the brakes to come to a stop so they don't get the ticket of the red light camera. Now, maybe... You know, I need to do some research into this about the technology of the red light cameras about, you know, when they ticket you and those types of things, you know, is the light completely solid red or, you know, it, you're in the intersection and it turns from yellow to red. Do you get a, a ticket at that juncture? Uh, when do you get the ticket for proceeding through the intersection? Like at what point does the light turn red? Uh, that would be kind of inter interesting information about that. Um, uh, intersection safety cameras as we're now calling them uh, Lawrence my examiner told me to drive according to traffic speed and not the speed limit uh, Lawrence your examiner told you to do that or the driving instructor told you to do that because that is not true <laughs> if you drive with the traffic flow on a driver's test uh, you are not going to be successful on passing that driver's test uh, Fred uh, my GPS tells me of red light cameras and shows my speed and the speed uh, limit, but it is not always accurate. I use a Garmin uh, camera. Yes, and mine is mine is similar as well. Uh, Tim, a rear ender is much more survivable than a T-bone crash, and you are absolutely right on that, Tim. Uh, mostly for rear end crashes, we're going to suffer uh, soft tissue damage uh, in our neck and those types of things, particularly if we don't have our head restraint 
adjusted correctly. And for all the smart drivers watching, uh, ensure that you have your head restraint adjusted correctly in your vehicle. At minimum, the top of the head restraint should be at the top of your ears. Uh, no lower than that because and it's not a headrest. It's not someplace to rest your head while you're driving. It's a head restraint. It stops your head from snapping back in the event that you get rear-ended. So ensure, you know, just go in and have a check and make sure that your, uh, your head restraint is adjusted correctly to protect you in the event of a rear-end crash. Uh, Tim says the light must be red before the vehicle enters the intersection for a red light photo be, to be taken. Okay, that I can understand and that I can see as a safety feature because I see too many drivers who are proceeding through an intersection and you know the light turns yellow and Tim, you've probably seen this many, many times and other people, other traffic safety authorities and those types of things you know the light is yellow and they go screaming through an intersection they're already accelerating as they're moving through the intersection so this happens a lot uh detailers from australia here uh speed cameras everywhere and radar detectors are illegal uh get uh we get hounded that speed cameras save lives which is deplorable uh road death toll is high with a small population and detailers that was the same sentiment and information that I got when I lived there in the early 2000s was that exactly what you said, speed cameras are everywhere, but nobody's pointing at Australia and saying, look at how much we have reduced traffic deaths in our driving population. Nobody has done that. So all of the speed cameras, it's very easy in light of that information to level the claim that this is simply nothing but a cash grab. And as I was saying earlier, my one, speed camera ticket that I got here a couple of years ago I felt the same way about it and I'll put the book down in the description here after I get done here I'll find the book and uh, he goes into a great deal of detail about speed cameras and levels uh, accusations similar accusations of uh, cash grabs at them all right uh, Tim the loneliest uh, book in the world might be your vehicle's manual the safety feature information is critical read in newer vehicles <laughs> I like the way you said that the loneliest book in the world. I believe that you're right, Tim, because I'm one of those weird people. I will read the instructions on almost everything. And, uh, you know, same thing with the driver's manual. If you want to know anything about your vehicle, you're trying to put kids booster seats in your car, uh, or you want to know something about the seat belts, I can guarantee you that there's at least 50 pages on child restraints and seat belts in your vehicle. So have a look at that if you don't know the information that you're looking for. You know, uh, fuses, <laughs> how the engine runs, how often to change the oil, transmission oil, maintenance, those types of things. Have a look at the owner's manual for tremendous information about your vehicle there. It's just a wealth of stuff that could save you money for sure. Uh, elevator, I have seen slower drivers hang out in the left lane uh, when there are numerous drivers waiting to go faster, which creates traffic congestion in the left lane. And that is absolutely true. Uh, left lane squatters, they drive the rest of us absolutely crazy. <laughs> those drivers that are driving five miles an hour above the posted speed limit in the fast lane and refuse to get out. Uh, as one of the funny uh, memes on Twitter the other day was, is, you know, you think you're really, cr you know, you think you're really cool driving five miles an hour over the posted speed limit in the left lane. But would you get out of the left lane? Because some of us want to break the law for real. <laughs> yes. Uh, Jake, just thought that's bad. Try the service manual. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the service manual. Nobody looks at that either. Uh, Fred, uh, seatbelts uh, here now come with reflective belts so that they can see it at night if you are wearing it or not. Uh, yes, I didn't know that, that they were reflective. Uh, and uh, the other thing, Fred, most of them in UPS trucks and other commercial vehicles uh, you'll see that they're a neon color so that they can actually see. But, you know, if with, with that reflective thing, now we're going to go back to the seatbelt, the stick-on seatbelt. <laughs> they had them in the early 1970s when the seatbelt laws first came into effect. Uh, and people refused to wear seatbelts, right, after, in, the, in that first generation. Uh, they had like a Velcro strap that would just like go on your chest. You can tell whether truck drivers are wearing seatbelts or not anyway. I had to wear company shirts for the one trucking company I worked for. And I was driving so much and working so much that I had actually worn my seats, my my 
my shirts rather uh, from the seat belt across my chest. The the, the seats the sh the shirts were actually frayed <laughs> from wearing the seat belts so much. Uh, yes, neon seat belts. They're here too. Awesome. Uh, David uh, never sped in a school zone, residential neighborhoods, or places that are known to have children present. Uh, they are the worst places to speeding for the safety of children. And that and David is exactly right. There are places where you can drive faster out on highways, freeways, places that you know there are not vulnerable road users around. You're, if you're speeding in cities, you're speeding in residential places, you're speeding around schools, you are simply being irresponsible. You are not being safe at all and you are endangering other people's lives. So, you know, tearing through a city, tearing through a residential area, speeding in a school zone, please don't do that. That's just not safe at all and you are seriously um, ramping up your chances and your risk of being involved in a crash. So exactly what David said there. Uh, Tim, ultimately, the faster you go, the less time you have to see, to think, and to react. Occasionally not doing the five over or even the speed limit might be critical. Yes, and coming back to what I was saying earlier, that driving faster than the conditions of the roadway will allow. As the conditions of the roadway deteriorate, so should your speed, right? If there's rain on the roadways, you shouldn't be driving more than the posted speed limit, maybe even less than the posted speed limit. If you're driving in the dark, you're driving in areas where there's lots of pedestrian traffic and those types of things, your speed is going to have to decrease. So yes, <laughs> you need to have time to think, have time to react as Tim was saying, and the faster you go, the less time you have to do that. So you need to think about where you're doing and what is situational awareness what is your situation awareness are you aware of what's going around what's happening and going on around your vehicle so excellent point there uh top guys uh just passed my class 7 road test this month just purchased a 2007 ford ranger and that is an awesome celebration gift of passing your driver's test getting a new ranger awesome awesome thank you so much for dropping back and letting us know that you passed your driver's test awesome my friend and just on a note there, pass your driver's test, first time course package available over at the Smart Drive Test website. Guaranteed to pass your driver's test first time. As a bonus, we throw in both the winter and defensive driving smart courses to keep you safe after you get your license. So 38 bucks, guaranteed to pass. Pick that up over at the Smart Drive Test website. Uh, Excellent. Uh, make you wear, want you to wear the reflective jackets. Yes, for safety, for sure. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, elevator, is it okay to use cruise control in the city? Uh, elevator, as for the most part, you don't want to be using cruise control in the city. I mean, if you have a long stretch of a straight road and there isn't any other traffic around and you're doing 70 kilometers an hour, 40 miles an hour, then maybe you could throw the cruise control on. But for the most part, you're not going to use it in the city. You're simply going to use it out on the highways and those types of things uh, is the best place to use cruise control. Uh, as I said, if you got a long stretch and, there, and it's 40 miles an hour or 70 kilometers an hour, then yes, you can. But for the most part, you know, again, it comes down to situational awareness of where you're going to use cruise control and whatnot. Uh, Mallory, seatbelts do save lives. Absolutely, seatbelts do, in fact, save lives. And there is absolutely no doubt about that. Many, many, many studies have shown that seatbelts save lives, and this is now why it is the law, and also why auto manufacturers are on board with this, because it's not just the law is the for the reason that we wear seatbelts. There's also devices in the vehicles that remind us to put our seatbelts on, very annoying ones, in fact, buzzers and lights and those types of things, and many of the newer vehicles actually will not move. Uh, 2017 Honda Pilot, for example, uh, a few years back I was shooting a video with uh, the company here in town and I'm in the parking lot trying to get the thing to move and of course it's a push button trans automatic transmission and it wouldn't move and uh, you know, I'm trying to get it to move and I'm like, what, what's going on? And then the, the salesperson come over and they're like, you need to put your seatbelt on. It won't go without your seatbelt on. So not some vehicles won't even, won't even, uh, move without your seat. If you're not wearing your seatbelt. 
Uh, Tim, uh, did you mention the slowdown and move over rules? Okay, so every state, every province now has the slowdown move over rules for emergency vehicles and service trucks, uh, tow trucks and those types of things on the roadways. And uh, I've actually seen here in the province of British Columbia some tow trucks uh, that are now, they have a blocker truck where they have two trucks out on the roadway and one will be blocking the lane and the other truck will be working on the highway which is a little daunting when you don't know what that practice is. But emergency vehicles on the side of the road, tow trucks, slow down to 70 kilometers an hour, 40 miles an hour, and move over to the left lane if you can, okay? If not, slow down, go past with caution. Keep these people safe who are out there working on our roadways to keep us safe and to get people out of the ditch and get them home safely to their families. Uh, Okay, Tyler, the biggest offense I find is drivers that speed up and erratically cut off other drivers. So yes, and exactly, Tyler, what I was talking about earlier, the complete mismanagement of space. They're weaving in and out of traffic. They're not aware of other vehicles, other people on the roadways, and they endanger other people because they're encroaching into their space and they're too close and they're driving too fast. So these are the types of things that cause crashes. The mismanagement of space, the mismanagement of speed. This is what's going to get you trouble into trouble out on the roadways. And as Tim said earlier, the nail that's sticking up, that's the one that's going to get hammered. That's the one that's going to get the ticket. So if you're being a crazy person out driving on the highway and you're weaving in and out of traffic, uh, trying to get ahead, which you're not going to get ahead very much, I will tell you that you're the person that's going to get the ticket. You're the one that's going to get pulled over by police because you're the one being a crazy person. Whereas if you're just out on the highway, you're on cruise control going down the road, you know, you're maybe five or 10 kilometers an hour above the, above the, above the posted speed limit, it's unlikely that you are going to get pulled over by police. Uh, Tim, you might get tagged for five over when uh, failing to slow down and move over. Yes, and that is a different scenario because you have to get over for emergency vehicles and you have to get over for tow trucks and those types of things to keep them safe. And they take this seriously when you endanger their lives, okay? So you could get ticketed for five kilometers an hour because that's considered excessive speed because you're endangering somebody's life uh, by mismanaging speed and space of your vehicle. Uh, this is a great rule, but sometimes here you cannot get over because of the driver, so I turn the flashes on and get over as far as I can and move uh, slowly by them. And this is, yes, and that is an excellent point of what Fred just said. If you are on a highway and there's an emergency vehicle on the side of the road, this is the move over laws, and you're slowing down, you're doing something unpredictable, then you need to get your four-way flashers on to indicate to other traffic that something goofy is going on. Uh, an example of that, a few weeks ago when we were going down to Vancouver Island, we were driving along the Fraser Canyon, there was lots of construction and whatnot. When I come up behind the stop traffic that was waiting for the pilot car to come back, I put my four-way flashers on until there was another car stopped behind me because, you know, sometimes people aren't paying attention. They're doing whatever. They're in whatever mental state. So protect yourself by getting your four-way flashers on and sitting there and watching what's coming up behind you because sometimes that traffic won't stop and you could pr potentially prevent yourself getting rear-ended by having your four ways on and watching the traffic come up behind you. So anytime that you're on a highway, anytime that you're on a freeway and interstate and the traffic comes to a stop, get your four ways on, watch the traffic coming up behind you and be prepared to move forward uh, so that that traffic behind you can get stopped and it's not gonna rear-end you and get into your trunk, okay? Because that's the last place where you want the parking. All right, uh, Jake, law enforcement takes the slowdown and move over law seriously. As Colon, uh, Colon, Colonel Clink said, there is nothing more personal than being killed. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Mallory stunting is another way to get a ticket from the police. Yes, it, yes it is. And uh, as Elevator Fan says, in many places, fines are doubled in construction zones. All right, we're at the end here for tonight. Check out the Pass Your Driver's Test First Time course package over at the Smart Drive Test website. Guaranteed to pass your driver's test first time. And uh, stay safe, manage speed, manage space around your vehicle well. If you passed your driver's test in the last couple of weeks, congratulations on that. And if you have a test coming up in the next week or so, good luck on that. 
And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.